Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be looking at periodic trends. So before we even discuss periodic trends, there are going to be a couple of definitions we're going to need to define. So the first is periodicity. So the word periodic table comes from the word periodicity, meaning that there is a regular repeating pattern. And it can either increase or decrease whatever that pattern is, depending on what group you're in or what period. So remember, groups, those are the columns, periods, those are the rows. So what three terms do we actually need to talk about? The first are called valence electrons. So your valence electrons are the outermost electrons that appear in the highest orbitals. And so I put highest in quotes because, again, it's a good way of visualizing where these orbitals are, but it's not necessarily the way they look in reality but they're generally the ones that are the furthest from the nucleus, right? So they're the ones that are in the highest orbitals. And when we say orbitals, we're talking about all of the things we learned about already. 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, all of those kinds of orbitals. So in this diagram here, the valence electrons are these blue ones right here on the outside. And same in this diagram, they're the blue ones that are out here. So what are the opposite then? What is the opposite of a valence electron? The opposite would be the core electrons. So core electrons, those are the inner electrons. And so again, I'm putting inner in quotes because um, even though I like to think of them as being, you know, again, on the inside, um, generally speaking, they're just any electrons that are not valence electrons. So the valence electrons are the highest orbital ones, the ones that are furthest away from the nucleus. The core electrons are the red ones. They're the ones that are closer and they're therefore going to be not used for chemical reactions and stuff because only the outermost electrons can do that sort of stuff. Okay, so going back to what we were talking about here, we have valence electrons, we have core electrons. So there has to be one last term we need to talk about called the effective nuclear charge. So the effective nuclear charge is the strength of the pull of the nucleus. So right here, we've got 12 protons and 12 neutrons. So that's a 12 plus charge pulling on all of these electrons. Right here, we have 17 protons and we have 18 neutrons. Again, 17 protons, that means 17 positively charged items in the nucleus that are pulling on the electrons themselves. So what we do is we don't just look at like what the positive charge is, that would be the nuclear charge, but it's the effective nuclear charge. So what we have to subtract here is the effect of the uh, core electrons. Because if you think about it, right, all of these little negative charges are being pulled by the nucleus. But the ones that are getting pulled, let's say the weakest, right, the ones that are getting less charge pull than the rest, are going to be the ones that are further away. Because think about it, right? The two electrons that are here in the 1s orbital are going to be pulled really, really closely because they have this full power of the 12 positive charges, or in this case, the full power of the 17 positive charges pulling on the actual electrons. But now we have these rings, okay, we have these other orbitals that are shielding the effect on the furthest ones that are out. And so it's called shielding. And it is the effect of, again, sort of like um, how much of the charge is really reaching these valence electrons. Um, and that's why it's called the effective nuclear charge, not just the nuclear charge, because this does have an effect on the pole. And so notice it says that uh, the radii are different sizes because they experience a different charge, a different pole. So right here, we have chlorine. Um, and so if we take our 17... Uh, protons and we subtract away the 10 core electrons, that's still a plus 7 effective nuclear charge. Whereas here, we have 12 protons and then we have 10 uh, core electrons again. And so notice that now we only have really a plus 2 effective charge that's pulling on these two um, valence electrons. So this one's going to be smaller because you have a, a greater charge that's pulling it closer, whereas magnesium's charge is less, so it's not going to be able to pull as much. These electrons are going to be able to go a little bit further away than these electrons are. And again, that's why it's called the effective nuclear charge. 
So the first one, which I kind of hinted at, I guess, let's say, is called the atomic radius. So the atomic radius is the first pattern that appears on the periodic table that we're going to look at. And it is the distance from the center of the nucleus to the furthest valence electron in the atom. And there is a regular repeating pattern. So these are your atomic numbers. And then this is the size of the radius. So again, like this would be hydrogen, this would be helium. Um, and we continue with the rest of them as we go up all the way. I think this goes to 36, so this goes all the way to zinc. But again, notice that there is a regular repeating pattern. So what is that pattern? The pattern is that as you go down a group, so as we're going down the periodic table, the atomic radius gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So these peaks that we see here, these peaks are going to be representing kind of the, the bottom part of uh, the periodic table as we go down a column. Um, and that's, again, just the pattern that appears. Now, why does that work, right? Why, as we go further down the periodic table, do we get increased size? Well, the effective nuclear charge decreases as you go down. And the reason why is because you're adding more core electrons. So you get more shielding. The more shielding you get, the less that big, you know, positive charge in the center of your nucleus is going to be able to reach the furthest electrons that are, you know, in the highest orbitals. And so remember that we're adding more core electrons because as we go down the periodic table, we are adding more orbitals. So we're going from like, you know, 1s, and then if you go down one, we've already gotten to the 2s, and then if you go down one again, 3s, and you keep going. So we keep getting further and further and further away. Now, what about left and right? As you go from left to right, as you cross the periodic table, atomic radius gets smaller. And that happens because the effective nuclear charge is going up and orbital size is not going up. So the electrons are still held very closely to the nucleus. So here is a visualization of that. So notice as we go down, like we said before, we get bigger and bigger and bigger atoms. And then as we go across, notice they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And that, again, is because of effective nuclear charge. I like to think of it as like tug of war. So um, effective nuclear charge is like having a big kid versus a bunch of little kids or something like that. The stronger the effective nuclear charge, the stronger the other kid is or the adult that's pulling on the other side of this, you know, little rope. Whereas if you add a couple more electrons, doesn't matter, that person is still going to be able to basically just pull on that rope and these kids are going to go flying. So here is our pattern. Here is our visualization of that and let's label some parts. So notice we have these valleys here. These valleys are the noble gases. So think about it, right? As we go across the periodic table then, things are getting smaller. So that means the column that is the furthest to the right is going to have the smallest atoms. And that's true. Opposite is also true. So as we go on the opposite side to the left, as we go down, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger atoms. That means that the alkali metals and hydrogen have the biggest radii for their particular uh, row or period, I guess I should say. And then just to point out, these are the transition metals. So generally speaking, the transition metals are very similar in size, but notice that the pattern continues and it's pretty much, you know, things are getting smaller as you go across. Next, electronegativity. We're going to abbreviate that as EN. That's the ability for an atom to attract electrons to itself. So it's kind of like a magnet. You can picture it like a magnet. Now, as you go down a group, electronegativity decreases. Reason why? The effective nuclear charge decreases, right, as we go down. So that means that it would be harder to attract electrons to an atom if your effective nuclear charge is not as good. So uh, this explains why alkali metals are so notoriously reactive. They can't really hold on to their electrons very well. So because they can't hold on to their electrons very well, they're not going to want to accept any more. Instead, they're going to willingly give their electrons up. Now, going from left to right, we get an increase in electronegativity. This happens because the effective nuclear charge is stronger as we go across, right? We're increasing 
our positive charges as we go across, but we're not adding more orbitals. So those core electrons are not really being affected. So this makes it easier to attract electrons because you're getting a stronger effective nuclear charge. So again, picture it just like the game of tug of war again. Now, most noble gases, though, do not attract nor repel electrons, so they normally have an electronegativity defined as zero. So like helium and neon, those ones have an electronegativity of zero, so we don't even normally include them when we're looking at um, you know, electronegativity. Now, what that does mean, then, if we're able to ignore most of these noble gases, is that fluorine becomes the most electronegative element. And this explains why the halogens are so notoriously good at stealing electrons from things. It's because they have a high effective nuclear charge, and so they're able to very easily attract electrons to themselves because of that. So here's our pattern. Notice as we go down, the electronegativity numbers are getting smaller, and as we go across, they are getting larger. Notice these three noble gases are pretty much defined as an electronegativity of zero. Argon has been known to form some compounds, but helium and neon really don't. Krypton, xenon, these ones that are getting really big, um, again, they have been known to have some um, actual attraction um, through electronegativity and stuff, but again, they don't normally form very many compounds. But notice that the pattern is mostly true. Yes, there are some obvious areas in the you know transition metals and stuff that don't follow the pattern, but again, those are rare. All right, so let's look at a, another chart of electronegativity. So let's point out our peaks and valleys. So the valleys here, these are our noble gases. So notice the first three, nothing, zero. This one definitely is an anomaly. Okay, so, you know, I think that's krypton, right? So krypton is an anomaly. What about our, our peaks here? So our peaks are the halogens. So we have, um, we have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, etc. right? Uh, and then yes, even hydrogen is, you know, has some electronegativity to it. So if we wanted to include hydrogen in there, we could include hydrogen also. Here's our transition metal pattern. Notice for the most part, it's consistent. Um, there are some obvious, uh, let's say, places where we have anomalies again, but there are reasons for those. It has to do with d orbitals and the fact that they're half filled or fully filled and stuff like that. So those are our transition metals. Last one, we have our ionization energy. We're going to abbreviate that as IE. That's the amount of energy that is required to remove an electron. So how much energy is it going to take you to turn an atom into an ion or to turn an ion into an even higher charged ion? So you've seen ions before. It's actually, again, what these little plasma globes are doing. It's ionizing gas. And so these little tendrils that you see are plasma, which is basically just ions. Um, and it gives you a cool visualization for what ions really look like. So going down a group, ionization energy decreases. And so this happens because larger atoms are more shielded, right? So the larger atoms have more core electrons, and so they have weaker effective nuclear charges. So if you have a weaker effective nuclear charge, that means it's going to be easier for you to remove an electron from it. So it actually costs you less energy because it's easy to remove an electron in that situation. Going left to right, though, it increases. Why? Think about it again. Smaller atoms are going to have stronger effective nuclear charges, making them more difficult to remove electrons from. And so that means that these guys, the noble gases, are impossibly difficult to remove electrons from. And it makes sense, right? They don't want to react with things, so it's going to cost you a lot of energy to try to make them react with things. What do we call these ionization energies? Well, if you want to remove one valence electron, we call that the first ionization energy. If you want to remove a second valence electron, that's called the second ionization energy. And you can keep going third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way up to 118. Um, you can have the 118th ionization energy of something. Now, each time, it's going to cost you more and more energy to remove those electrons, though. All right, here is our general pattern. Notice as we go down, ionization energies are getting lower and lower. So, so far, francium has the lowest ionization energy. It will easily lose its electron. Just give it some energy and it will lose its electron. Whereas we have, uh, I almost said hydrogen, helium has the highest. It's going to be extremely difficult to remove even just one electron from 
helium. And this is a chart of first ionization energies. Let's look at our little patterns here. So again, not as nice as the other ones, but still we have peaks. Our peaks are our noble gases. Our valleys are gonna be our alkali metals and hydrogen. And then the transition metals form this kind of nice little pattern that peaks out at zinc. And then when we go to the next column on the periodic table, it kind of goes back down. No, not next column. Well, yeah, next column on the periodic table. All right, so hopefully you found that useful. If you have any questions, let me know.